And so let's look at this today. We're going to start with that idea of singleness. Is that, what's the advantage of, to that in the church? Because here's the way we're generally raised. And, and maybe it's also uh, consistent with our, our, our human inclinations is we want to find somebody. We want to be married. There's very few people that from a very young age are kind of like, you know what, I think I want to be single. We, we are looking towards that, finding that person that God has made for us, that God is, has, has perfect match for us, and we, we think that way. But it seems to indicate from Paul that some people are actually given this gift of singleness, that, that there's advantages to that. And, and so we begin with this reason. Why is Paul saying this? He's saying that because singleness can be a great asset to your ministry. If you are, if you are single, if you're not, and I'm going to use this word and in, in don't, don't take it in the wrong way, but there, it can have a detrimental effect on your ministry. I mean, when, when you get married or before you're married, there's, there's like not so many things limiting you. You get married, all of a sudden, all those things that you could do, all those things that you would want to do for the Lord now, it, the, the list isn't as long. You don't have as great an opportunity. And I don't say that to say that as a married person, you don't really need to get involved in missions and ministry. You should be. But understand this. When you marry, that you are not going to have the opportunities that you had prior to that when you were unmarried. When I, back in 2004, I went on my, my first mission trip and did it with a, 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 a youth mission organization. And, and man, I loved it. I, I, it was awesome. But you know what? When I went, the first time I went for training and then headed to the mission field, I was gone like two and a half weeks. I, I had to go for training in Texas and then to Costa Rica and back to Texas for debriefing. And so by the time I got home, it was like two and a half weeks. It was an awesome experience. It opened up my heart and my mind to missions that I still have today. But I had to understand this, that I couldn't just randomly do that whenever I wanted. My marriage, my kids back home, that, that limited me for my ability to do that. That same thing's true about Paul. Paul went on mission trips that lasted a year. Paul went on mission trips that would take him, eventually he would end up in jail. And so we need to understand that and think about that. Singleness enables us to be able to serve God in that way. Marriage is going to create limitations into what we're able to do in our life with Christ. Now, I want to say this. If you are married, and, and at any point this jumps into your head today, you know what? You know what? If I was single, I could do those things. So maybe I should be single. That's not coming from the Lord. God wants us committed and staying in marriage. In fact, he's going to walk on into that in, the, in, in next week's text. But, but understand this, that if you're not married and before you get married, you need to think about that, evaluate that, that God has created an opportunity for you to do great work. And even if it's just now, might be a time where he calls you to marriage. But maybe right now is a time to really commit yourself fully to, to ministry. So singleness can be a great asset to ministry. Singleness grants a person the freedom and the flexibility to serve the Lord. You're going to be able to do things that you could not do before. Why? Because family responsibilities. Because of the kids. Because of your job. All of those things create these limitations in what we're able to do and how we serve God. Now I believe that as, as Christians, as married Christians, we have incredible opportunities to serve us to the Lord. But we need to understand this, that when we're married, when you make that decision to covenant with somebody for life, that there is, there is going to now require you not to be able to do those things that you maybe would like to do. You do not have the freedom, you do not have the flexibility to do all the things that you would be able to do apart from marriage. And so taking all that into consideration, as you ask yourself that question, as you ask yourself that question, should I get married? Should I remain single? This, this comes at the heart of it. This really helps you see and understand and come to a right conclusion. To come to a place where you can truly see the giftedness that God has given to you in whether it is in singleness or marriage. So what is the obstacle to singleness? What is it that, that you know, we say, well... Loneliness. I don't want to be lonely. I, you know, what, what are the things that, that, that would get in the way of, of, of singleness? Well, Paul addresses it here. And it's no surprise. 
And it is the greatest obstacle to singleness is the inability to control one's passions. He says this, it would be better to marry than to burn. It would be better, it would be better that you would get married than engage in sexual immorality. That's what he's saying. It would be better to get married than if you are going to try to live in in the giftedness of singleness, but still engage in the sexual immorality of the world. That was the struggle that they were having. Should I get married? Is it better to be married? Is it be better to be single? And the answer to that is probably yes. They're both good. But, but finding and discovering what it is that God has called us to is critical. And maybe one of the greatest indications for whether or not you're called to singleness is this. Do you have control over your physical passions? Do you control those? What I mean by that is this. is If you are living in singleness, but you've got to engage in some kind of physical intimacy with somebody else, you are probably not called to singleness. You're called gifted in the area of marriage. And maybe you would even say this, well, you know what, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not engaged in any kind of physical relationship with anybody else, but I'm incredibly tempted by pornography. I'm incredibly tempted by, by, by those, those sexual images and thoughts that, that are outside of marriage. And again, the answer would be the same thing. Well, then you're probably not called to singleness. What you're certainly not called to is living in sexual immorality, whether in marriage or singleness. And so Paul lays that out there for us to understand. If you have decided that you are, God has called you to love as a single person, at least at this point in your life, then, then there should be a control over those physical passions that exist in your life. And in that, and in that, if that is true, then then maybe God has truly called you to live in singleness. How do you figure that out? How do you determine that? I, I think the best way is this, is that if you are single now, take advantage of this time and pour yourself fully into serving God, into his ministry and his mission work. And you know what's going to happen out of that? One of two things. Either God is going to bring somebody into your life as your covenant partner, or God is going to just fulfill your life and mission and ministry to the degree that you really don't have that incredible, insatiable desire to be in a a full-time relationship a a permanent relationship with somebody. And so Paul lays out that so that we can understand and truly pursue what it is that God has gifted us in. And so that leads us into this idea of sexual intimacy. And and so in, in this case, he makes it very clear from the very beginning, and it is that sexual intimacy, sexual relations, is only permissible in the context of Christian marriage. That's the rule that God has laid down. And so, and so if that's the case, which that is the case, then how do we respond to that? Well, if we're living, we're not married, but we're engaged in sexual intimacy with another person, then we are obviously in, in sin. We're living in violation of what God has said to us. Now, it's the context of Christian marriage, not just marriage. What does that mean? Well, that means this is limited to those who are in a covenant marriage, a Christian covenant marriage, but also this, that it's with one man and one woman. That means that we don't get the opportunity to say, well, I'm married, so I can have as many physical relationships as I want. No, one man, one woman. And also, one man, one woman. He's not speaking of same-sex relations. It's not saying that we're okay to be married as long as you love each other, as long as you're in that intimate relationship, even if you're the same sex. That's not what he says. He says, Christian marriage, that is where physical intimacy is permissible in God's eyes, in the context of Christian marriage. And so we might look at this and wonder, what's the advantage of this? Why, Why is this important? Well, In the idea of a marriage, 
We can, we can understand it in terms of, do I get married or not? But once we're in the marriage, is this important? And, and Paul points out, this is incredibly important. That physical intimacy in your relationship is vital to the health and strength of your relationship. To vital to the, the health and strength of a marriage. And so this isn't just, just some little add-on that God has given us. Just something to kind of entertain us once a week. Twice a week. Well, it, it, this, is, this is foundational. This is critical. This is important. This is the greatest means of demonstrating your love to somebody else in the physical sense. And so it's vital to the health and strength of the relationship, of the marriage. In fact, he says it's so important. It's so vital that you got to re- fulfill your responsibilities. You can't. You can't just say, you know what, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't, I, don't, I don't enjoy it. That there's a responsibility to us in this. And the reason is because it is so vital to the health and strength of marriage. And so he lays out, it's so important that he says this. If you are going to take some time off in your physical relationship with one another, if you're going to take a sabbatical of sorts, you're going to, you're going to put it aside for, he said, there's two, two, only two things that have to, to be uh, understood about this. And, and those two things are this. And it is that se- sexual abstinence in marriage should be temporary and it should be consensual. And so if we make a decision, you know what, we're going to take some time off in our physical relationship. In, 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 this, in this text, he says, maybe to devote it to prayer, so in a way, it's kind of being treated like fasting. That we're, we're going to limit our physical relationship with one another so we can just focus our hearts and minds on Christ. It'll be the same way if you deprived yourself of food. And so it could kind of be used in that way. So there's a purpose behind it. But he says this, it needs to be temporary. There, it's never okay to say, you know what? We're done with that. We don't need that. I did my duty for the last 40 years. We're finished. He's saying, no, if you're going to do this, temporary. We're going, to, we're going to set a date. We're going to say this is where it starts and this is where it ends. And then we're going to resume our physical relationship with one another. It's temporary. The second thing is this. It's consensual. It means it's been agreed upon. That one of you don't get to make the call exclusively. One of you don't get to say, you know what, we're going to fast. I'm going to fast from sex. You do what you want, but that's what I'm going to do. No. It's, it's temporary. We're going to do it for a period of time. It's consensual. We've agreed upon it. And so he lays out those requirements in terms of abstinence in the marriage relationship in the area of of physical relationships and sexual intimacy. And so in the relationship, if we're going to take some time off, we're going to agree upon it, it's going to be for a limited period of time. The next thing is this. And when you think about this, and I would ask you this, if I'd ask you in your Marriage relationship, who controls the thermostat? Who, who turns the heat up? Who is always turning the heat down? You know, I, I've been in houses. I've been in houses where the thermostat had like a, like a plastic cover and a lock on it. Now, I've seen that in places of business, but I've been in houses that had that on. Now, why'd they do that? Well, there was one person in the house who was going to run the thermostat. Nobody else got to make that determination. I'll bump it up, I'll bump it down. And, 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 uh, and, and we, maybe we battle over that, we fight over that. But in that same way, when it comes to our physical relationship, our sexual intimacy, generally speaking, one of you is controlling the thermostat. One of you is generally making the determination, the decisions about those things. And you might say, well, that has to be that way, doesn't it? But here's what Paul said. He said, your body doesn't belong to you. It actually, it belongs to your spouse. And your spouse gets to make that decision. And you're saying, well, wait a second. If both are given that, if both are given the authority over the thermostat, how's that going to work? It's just going to be a constant battle, pushing it up and down. The answer to that. We're going to see in just a minute. But we need to understand this. In relation to sexual intimacy in marriage, you need to give your spouse control of the thermostat. And, and you're like, no. No. I, I have no desire to, to hand that over to my spouse. 
But remember, your spouse has been given that same command. Now, what would happen if that happened? What would happen if both of you came into the relationship with, were like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to let you make the call. You make the determination, and I'll, I'll respond to that determination. You know what that is? That's selflessness. Selflessness means, you know what, this, this isn't about me. This is about you. Our physical relationship isn't about just me being satisfied. It's about you being satisfied. And, and if we, as husbands and wives, would enter into our physical relationship with that mentality, let me tell you, your physical relationship would be what you want it to be. In fact, I would say this. It would be beyond what you'd want it to be. Because all of a sudden, there isn't this selfish attitude in relation to how we treat one another physically, but this willingness to give ourselves to the other person. That is what makes a physical relationship what it is. And I believe this. I believe when we live in selflessness, because here's the truth. We need to recognize this. That two different people have two different, sometimes great differences in terms of of their sexuality. Some of you have greater desires than the other person. How does that work out in a house? How does that work out in a marriage when somebody is like really, really interested in this and somebody's not? What happens in that respect? Well, I think what happens is this. When we give ourselves selflessly to the other person, when we are more concerned about our spouse than we are the other person, something incredible happens and it's this. That all of that kind of begins to fit together. Things begin to be what we both want. As, as, as our own desires fade, we begin to be complementary towards one another. And I don't mean that in giving compliments to one another. I mean that we need to fit together in the right way in our desires and our wants because we're living for what somebody else wants, not purely what we want for ourselves. And so in that, in that, it begins to be the relationship that we want and the relationship that God wants. I had somebody come up to me, and I won't give names, but I had somebody come up to me after the service today, and they said, that, that was awesome. And they said, you know what? And I'm, you know, I don't know. I hope you're okay with this. I hope, you're, I hope this doesn't make you uncomfortable. But they said, the older you get, the better it is. <laughs> and you know what they said? They said, because... Because they've come to that place where they, they, they really, they, they know one another so deep and so intimately. And, and I thought, man, that, that, that's awesome. I, I, I was blessed to, to, to hear that. But I believe that's what happens when we give ourselves selflessly over to somebody else, that things begin to kind of fall into place in a way that leaves both people, both partners satisfied. You know what? There's no normal in that this is how many times, you know, it's wherever, wherever you fit together as a couple, that's, that's the normal. But God says that we need to make sure that we make that a priority in our life. Martin Luther said, let the wife make her husband glad to come home and let him make her sorry to see him leave. I think that's a picture of what we just looked at here. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be awesome that, that you love your you, you love your husband, so, or you love your wife so much, she can't wait to see you walking in the door. And you walk in the door, and you love your wife so deeply and so intimately, she is sorry when you go out the door. I think that's Martin Luther has got something here that belongs on the refrigerator. This is something that is foundational, important in a marriage. That, that when we love selflessly, whether it's physically or other, any other element of our life as husband and wife, when that happens, this is what happens. That I can't wait to see you come home, and I'm sorry that you're going to leave. And, and so Martin Luther actually was not married until a little later. Uh, he, he, was, he was very involved, you might have heard, in the Reformation. The whole turning of the church uh, towards Protestantism. The, the protest movement of the church, Martin Luther was the one that really started all that. When he started that, he really didn't have too much time for a wife. He didn't really have the time to devote to that. He had the freedom and flexibility to begin a whole new movement in, in Christianity. 
But eventually he settled down and found a wife. And this was the profound truth that emerged from his marriage, that he would that let the wife make her husband glad to come home and let him make her sorry to see him leave. And so the fact that we're two different people, the fact that you and your spouse are two different people, we, we are going to run into moments when really we don't match. Things aren't kind of working the way we would want to. And we might even use it in this way. You might even use it as a cudgel. It's kind of like a, either like a, a reward or a punishment, you know? If you get to get your dog to, if he sits and, and, and shakes, his, shakes your hand, you give him a treat. And so we begin to, to treat sexuality and marriage in that same way. Here's your little reward. Keep doing what you're doing. And, and, and that, that, that is, is not biblical. That is not the means God will want us to function in our physical relationship and in marriage. But we understand that there's going to be these problems. There's going to be moments where we don't really feel like it. And what we need to make sure that we don't do is that we don't begin to use it as this kind of reward punishment thing. In fact, when you deprive your spouse of sexual intimacy, you put him or her in a place of temptation. That's what Paul says here. When you do not meet your your physical relationship requirements as God describes them, then you have placed your partner in a place of temptation. You might say, well, I'm not worried about that. He works at a construction site. He's not around other women all day. That's not going to be a problem for us. But the problem is, especially today, sexual morality is as close as our phone. It's available right here. We, we, we can, in, in a moment, access things that we would never dream possible 30 years ago. And so when you deprive, and I'm going to speak specifically to women because I think it generally is more of a problem for men, is that when you deprive your husband of physical intimacy, you are putting him into a place of temptation where that becomes more of a, more of a possibility. Now, I think when it comes to the other side, when it comes to husbands and wives, wives are much more, much more emotional. And when you deprive your wife of physical intimacy, when you don't, don't give to her that emotional, physical intimacy that occurs in sexual intimacy, you are putting them in a place of temptation where they will look for someplace else to find that. That might be work. It might be online. But, but in some way, you've put them into a place of temptation. You, you love your spouse, and you grant to them their conjugal rights, as God describes it, and you will more likely keep them out of that place of temptation that they will face. And so, use that. Make sure that we don't use our physical relationship with one another as a means to get what we want, to punish to reward, but simply because God has commanded us for that. And so we come down to this then, at the end, where Paul describes it this way. And we begin with that question, is it better to be single or is it better to be married? Because Paul says, I wish you were all like me. I wish you were all single. He's looking at putting together his mission team. I wish you were all single. But when we look at this, we find the answer isn't one or the other, it's either. It could be either. In fact, I would say this. Today, you could be called to a life of singleness and next year, you could be called to a life of marriage. But understanding that both of them are a gift from God. And wherever it is that you are today, see it as that. This is a gift. So if you're living in, in, in singleness today, understand that if God has gifted you in that area, He'll prepare you and, 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 and enable you to function in that. Now, here's the thing that you're probably questioning yourself is, how do I know? How do I know if God has called me to a life of singleness? Here's what I would recommend. That you just pour yourself in to whatever ministry and mission that you have right now that God has put before you. You give yourself over to that fully. And I believe when you do that, 
what's going to happen is God is going to confirm to you whether or not that is the calling and the gift that you have received or there is somebody going to come into your life to be that gift of marriage that you've been looking for, that you've been hoping for, wondering. Now, we need to recognize it in this way too. That when we think of singleness and marriage, we have to recognize this too. There are people who have been divorced. There, there are people who are, who are widowed. And, and so we're not always, this isn't just always about 18-year-olds and 55-year-olds. People of all ages who are in this place of singleness and maybe not of your own choice. You, you, you ended up where you are, not because you wanted to be where you are, but it's where you are. And so what does God want for you? Well, whatever it is, if there is, if there is, is an opportunity for you to pour yourself into some type, some type of mission and ministry, do that. And, and, and just trust God. He will, he will show you steps that you need to take and the steps that will lead you to a life fulfilled by mission and purpose or he'll lead you to a life in, in the giftedness of marriage. Whatever it is, God, God has the ability to lead you in whatever direction it is he wants you to go. Now, if you are married, if you're married and this kind of bothers you and you're, this kind of hurts because you look at this and you realize that's not me. I'm not living that way in my marriage relationship. I'm not, I'm not living selflessly when it comes to my physical relationship. What does God want for you? He wants you to live selflessly. And that, what's that require? That requires repentance. That, that admitting that, that that is not the life I've been leading with my spouse, and, and, I'm gonna, and today I'm going to allow God to change me in that, in that regard. Now the other side is this, is that maybe you're single, but you're living immorally. Whether it's in a physical relationship or whether it's... it's uh, pornography online, whatever it is, you're, you're looking at this, I'm single, I'm not married, but I'm truly living immorally. Then the answer to that obviously is what? Well, God says it would be better to marry than burn. And God says either, either get married or, or you're going to have to repent. You're going to walk away from this immoral lifestyle and live fully for him. And these are challenging things in the church today. This is difficult. Back in the, at the turn of the century, the 1900s, the, 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 the number of people, the percentage of people who entered into marriage who had never engaged in, 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 in sex at that point was like 80%, 80 to 90%. And today it's like, it's like 10%. It, it's, 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 it's Corinth all over again. And so God wants us to live in this sexual purity if we're not going to be married. And so I challenge you today that if that's you, or in your marriage if you're behaving sexually immoral, by viewing things you shouldn't, by being involved in a relationship you shouldn't, then, then the answer is repentance. The, the answer is always repentance. It's turning away from walking the wrong way and giving yourself fully over to what God has commanded us, what God has planned for us.